and Christophian Talks podcast. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. Thank you so much for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help each one of us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post at the start of each week for you to listen with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to hear. And now let's hear more about this week's talk. This week's talk is titled Michael, Your Prince, presented by Brother Ron Cowie. This was given at the Texas Bible School in the year 2000. This talk, and I'm not sure how this works, on the Christelphian Vault website has 15,000 downloads. So I'm assuming that includes streams as well, maybe not actually downloading of the files. Um, but it's an, it's, that's an impressive number, and we, we, want to do, we did want to include it because it's very, very interesting, very compelling. Uh, Brother, Je- Brother Ron, excuse me, does make uh, some kind of stretches or leaps, I would say, in logic, but it's still very useful to think that way, um, to hear uh, how things possibly could be, um, but, uh, and also, but obviously still an amazing uh, and very encouraging collection of verses that help us build out this character of Michael uh, in relation to uh, the Lord Jesus and God and the work that they do, and also uh, his counterpart, Gabriel, and the other angels. So this is a, this is definitely a great talk. If I was, I'm I'm probably going to listen to it again with a notepad or my actual Bible out instead of just listening in the car uh, to be sure I get it, get down some of the notes from this talk. Please do keep your suggestions coming. Email us good Christadelphian talks at gmail.com or talk to us on our social channels. It's a huge help to us. And we do have the extended podcast out now. So you can look for another podcast called Good, Good Christadelphian Talks Extended, which will have the whole series. So we'll actually put this whole series up there eventually. This is class two of six classes. Um, so here it is, Michael, your prince, from the seri- series Angels with Brother Ron Cowie. Brother Chairman and my dear brethren and sisters and young people, We notice that there were three reasons for us to consider the angels of God, the family of God in heaven. They are the army of God that does his will in the earth. We're told in Daniel 4 and verse 35 that he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And they have the responsibilities to be watchers, even holy ones. That God might set up amongst the kingdom of men whomsoever he will. That he might remove kings and establish kings according to his divine timetable and his purpose. And so we see in the, in the angels great motivation for our future role in the earth. But they are currently God's army, God's family. And as with any army or family, there is a need for order and for leadership, for direction and for structure. And amongst the angels we find plenty of evidence of clear lines of authority and leadership. They are are a host well commanded. They operate efficiently and cooperatively with each other. And there are leading angels with special responsibilities. We would expect in the kingdom of God that with the great work that God has given to the hands of the saints, that the great men of faith will have command over many other saints. I can see Paul and his companions undertaking the greatest ever gospel proclamation campaign in the world. Elijah going to rescue the Jews with many others assisting him. Moses and Daniel and Joseph and Abraham and the apostles, all of them in great positions of authority. The apostles themselves reigning over the twelve tribes of Israel. All of them with unique roles to undertake and many others assisting them in that process. And so we find amongst the angels unique tasks and commanding angels and serving angels. And today we're going to look, God willing, at Michael and Gabriel, the supreme commanders of God's army. Those two who share the intimate knowledge of the divine timetable and thereby have to inform and instruct other angels. We're going to first look at Michael because he is without doubt the preeminent angel of the Bible his name means Michael he who is like unto God and I believe that name was given to him as his new name as part of his immortalization we're told in Revelation that God will give to many of us new names 
which will be a name which indicates our connection to God. And Michael is called the one who was like unto God because of all the angels. He was given the privilege of being God's personal representative, the representative of the Father upon the earth. He's the only angel in the Bible called an archangel, a chief angel, as we find in Jude verse 9. We know there were several leading angels. We have in Daniel chapter 10 the phrase, Michael, one of the chief princes. And so it seems there were a number of those that were regarded as chief princes. Certainly two of them were in that company. But he was the archangel. And he had an incredibly vital role and that was to represent God on the earth until such time as the Lord Jesus Christ was glorified. And so Michael was basically the stand-in for Christ until Christ ascended to heaven. Our pioneer brethren in their writings very clearly understood this relationship of one angel representing the Father on the earth. This is a series of quotations, all of them just extracted from Elpis Israel, just to show you that our pioneer brethren, without even explaining the point of view, accepted that there was this Yahweh angel that stood upon the earth to represent God. It will be seen that the everlasting God talks or acts or through these Elohim, but chiefly through one of them, styled the Yahweh Elohim. And so we have the angel that bears God's name who comes into the earth to act on God's behalf. The servant had seen the Yahweh Elohim and his companion Elohim. He heard the, the Yahweh Elohim and the other Elohim conversing on their experience of good and evil. And Brother Thomas paints the picture of the angels as a group walking through the garden with the Yahweh Elohim leading the conversation, instructing the other angels as to what they should do. There was a declaration made in the presence of the Yahweh Elohim. The arch Elohim said, the Lord of the Elohim himself declares, he will, the Elohim Elohim executed by his spirit. Therefore said the chief of the Elohim, let us make man. So you see, Brother Thomas just assumes this this personality of the angel. When it reads that Yahweh said this or Yahweh did that in Genesis, Brother Thomas just assumes the personality of that angel. So we find that this angel has that authority to speak for God. His name, Michael the Archangel, as we said, indicates his purpose. He is to represent God. And we find in the record that he's called in Isaiah 63 and verse 9 the angel of God's presence. Gabriel also was one who stood in the presence of God, but Michael was the angel of God's presence. He was the right-hand man, if you like, that stood in God's presence until Christ came to heaven and sat down in God's presence. No angel ever is said as sitting in God's presence. They stand in respect of the Father. But he's the one, the angel, that stands in God's presence, as Isaiah 63 verse 9 says. He is the name-bearing angel. That's his work. My name is in him, said God in Exodus 23. And the remarkable thing about Michael, he's the only angel that speaks in the first person for God. Every other angel comes along and says, Thus saith the Lord, or the will of the Lord is this, or Yahweh intends to do that. Michael comes along and when he speaks, he says, I will do it. I will do it. I want you to come with me to Genesis chapter 18 and just look how this operates. And I want you to notice how... Clearly the Bible delineates the difference between Michael and the other two angels that came to see Abraham. Remember three men came to him and there was in that group the Yahweh angel and two, we might say respectfully, ordinary angels. Now we find it goes from they, the two, to the one angel now takes over the conversation and he said, I will certainly return unto thee. So you see, he doesn't say Yahweh will return unto thee, he says I See, he's God's personal representative on the earth. I will certainly return unto you at the time of life and Sarah shall have a son. And it says that Sarah was actually behind him in the tent. So she thinks, she's there looking out through the corner of the tent over this, this angel's shoulder. And that's why she laughed because she thought that he couldn't see her. 
she did not realize at the time that this was, was the great Yahweh angel. You can imagine how Sarah would have trembled when she realized whose words she was laughing at. And so he said, Is anything for too hard for Yahweh? And you notice in verse 14, Is anything too hard for Yahweh? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee. There again is the first person. Again in verse 20, when Abraham stays with the Yahweh angel, he says in verse 20, And Yahweh said, in verse 21, I will go down, I will know. And so we read in verse 22 that the two men went their way towards Sodom. The two angels went to Sodom. Very likely they were the individual angels of Lot and his wife. They went down to Sodom and Abraham stood yet before Yahweh. He's in the presence of this Yahweh angel. When the other angels get to Sodom, in Genesis 19 and verse 14, they actually say to Lot, Up, get you out of this place for Yahweh will destroy it. They don't say we will destroy it. They say that we are here under the authority of that Yahweh angel. He will destroy this city, but he seemed as one that mocked. And so you see, everything those other angels did, they were doing on behalf of Michael, the Yahweh angel. Later on it says that they took Lot by the hand, Yahweh being merciful under him. So they were very much under Yahweh's direction, under this mighty angel's direction. And Abraham stayed to negotiate with the Yahweh angel. Now let's just, again, look at some references to this Yahweh angel. Just a few in Genesis that we know so well, which make a lot more sense when you see that this is talking about God's personal representative angel on the earth. The Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and took one of his ribs. I don't know about you, but I, for years, imagined this sort of hand coming down through the cloud and, and operating on Adam. But when you actually think about it, it required someone to be there to actually put him to sleep, to open his side, to take out the rib and from that to create a woman. And the Yahweh angel was there to do that. He then subsequently married the two of them and they had a presence, they had a ceremony in the presence of the Yahweh Elohim. And he spoke the words of God to Yahweh Elohim of the Hebrews has met with us. Yahweh said, I will stand before thee there on the rock. Yahweh spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And once we understand this concept of God sending an angel to represent him who has the power not only to speak in the first person for what God would have to be said but to make decisions for God then we understand that this is a wonderful way that God represents himself on the earth. For example, look at Genesis 18 and verse 18 or verse 17. Now, this is, this is interesting because it's not automatic for the angel what he has to do. He has to think about this. And Yahweh said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And he reasons through the process that because Abraham will use the information wisely, then he will inform Abraham about what's about to come to pass. And from that, brethren and sisters, we take the exhortation that if our desire is to teach our household the principles of Yahweh, the angels can work with us. And that's what they did here. Because Abraham was of that mind, they were happy to work with him and to inform him of things, grievous though they were, that he would use to advantage with his children and his servants. So the Yahweh angel appeared in all those instances and you can find hundreds of others in which the Yahweh angel is actually there. One of the best proofs of this particular concept is found in the burning bush because in this, these verses about the bush we have interchangeably the words Elohim, Yahweh and angel used to describe the party that was speaking for God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. So the angel was there in the bush. When Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, Elohim called unto him out of the midst of the bush. So you the terms are quite interchangeable. But notice which Elohim it was. The way Elohim speak for God, so many passages in the Bible actually start to make sense because there is God's representative there on the earth. A lamp of fire passed between the pieces. When Abraham offered the sacrifices, the fire of Yahweh passed between those pieces. The angel of Yahweh appeared in the bush. We've seen that one. Exodus 13:21. Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by a night in a pillar of fire. So the angel entered in the flame of the altar and they saw the God of Israel and it was under his feet, as it were, a work of a sapphire stone. And we'll come to that in our next study, God willing. So there are appearances of Yahweh upon the earth. They saw the Elohim of Israel and under his feet there was this appearance of a sapphire stone. 
And so we find that the angels represent God on the earth. And we need to be aware of the angels when we read very simple scriptures like the one in the first of Samuel, chapter 3 and verse 10. Samuel twice hears the voice and on the third occasion it says, And Yahweh came and stood and said, I will do a thing under the house of Eli. And that angel was actually there to tell Samuel what the judgments of the father were. Because God was working primarily through the Jewish nation, you would expect that Michael's major work was to be the angel that worked with Israel. And so it was. He came in the bush to say that I have seen the affliction of my people. This is he, that Moses, that was in the ecclesia in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him. And so you have this particular angel that was given to guide Israel through their wilderness journeys and into the land. And we're told in Jude verse 9 that Michael the archangel is the Yahweh angel that contends for the body of Moses, for the people of Israel who were baptised into Moses. His focus is upon Israel and the kingdom of God, upon the big picture of God's national movements. Let's just take a look at Michael in a little more detail. These are some of the things that are said about Michael. In Exodus 23, Israel were told that I send an angel before thee, beware of him, for my name is in him. Don't provoke this angel. Now most angels are something we greatly fear, but God said this angel is not one to be provoked because my name is in him. He's a holy angel. He was the angel of God's presence. He was the prince of the host of Yahweh, Joshua was told. He's one of the chief princes in Daniel chapter 10. He's Michael your prince in Daniel 10 verse 21. You see the connection very much to the people of Israel. And in Jude verse 9, Michael the archangel contending for the body of Moses. He was very much concerned with the things of Israel. I want you to notice in Exodus 33 that after the incident of the golden calf that this angel was actually removed for a time from the children of Israel because they had proved themselves an unholy people in worshipping the golden calf that the angel was taken away from them. Come to Exodus 33 and verse 2. Now after the incident of the golden calf God says to Moses, go on, go to the land and in verse 2 I will send an angel before thee and the translators have very much tried to indicate the difference in angels by putting a capital on some angels and not putting a capital on others. And, and this one they've got right, I will send an angel before thee, I will drive out the Canaanites, etc. But he says in verse 3, For I will not go up in the midst of thee. And what Moses was being told here was that because of their sins, yes he would send an angel, yes he would cut off the Canaanites, but it won't be the Yahweh angel. I can't go, Moses in the midst of this people because they are an unholy people now that was a dramatic blow to Moses we might think it was a bit insulting for Moses not to want the other angel but Moses knew that if he was going to lead that people with all their sinfulness into the land and be successful he would need the greatest of the angels with him and now the angel is saying I won't go we'll come to verse 7 see what Moses does it says in verse 7, Moses took the tabernacle. Now I want to just clarify, this is not the tabernacle with all the laver and the, the uh, altars and so forth. The tent that is being talked about here is the tent of meeting. There was another tent in which Moses would go and meet the angel face to face that had been put up alongside the tabernacle in the camp. Moses took the tent of meeting, or the tent of witnesses it's called elsewhere, and he took that tent of meeting out of the camp of Israel and he erected it outside the camp so that the angel might at least be able to talk with him. And so we find that Moses took that and, and, and everyone that sought Yahweh had to separate from the rest of the children of Israel and come out to the tabernacle of the congregation. That was the tent of meeting which was without the camp. It came to pass that when Moses went out there they stood at their tent doors and they watched Moses go out there with his tent of meeting. And we find that the Yahweh angel condescends to once again meet him in that tent of meeting. Now that he's indicated that he agrees with God's estimation, that God is too holy to walk amongst this people, he's actually signified that by putting the tent outside the camp. And so the angel now comes back and sees him face to face. In verse 9, and it says there that the cloudy pillar came and stood at the door of the tent and Yahweh talked with Moses. And son, the Yahweh angel could communicate with him if he was not amongst them. And we find in verse 11 that Moses once again finds this close fellowship with his friend the Yahweh angel. 
And Yahweh spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And then having made peace as it were, Moses does a most remarkable thing. He walks away from the angel in that tent and he goes back into the camp and speaks to the angel from within the camp. So Moses as a mediator identifies with his people and says, I am with them. And he pleads with them from the camp. And he said in verse 12, You've said unto me, Bring up this people, and you've not let me know with whom thou wilt send with me. Now we might think it was almost presumptuous to say to the Yahweh angel, Well, thanks for the offer of the other angel, but really I don't know who he is. Now Moses wasn't insulting the other angel. What he was saying to Michael was, I desperately need your power. I need to have the closest representation to the Father if I'm going to do anything with his people. And he said in verse 12, I know you by name and I've found grace in your sight. You're my friend. I need you. And so he pleads, show me thy way. Consider this people as God's people. And in verse 14, the angel replies to Moses, my presence, that's the presence of the Father, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Moses I'm telling you, I can deal with you, but I can't deal with them. I'm too holy to look upon evil. I can deal with you, Moses, but I can't deal with them. And in verse 15, Moses says, If your presence goes not, forget with me. Moses never said that. If your presence doesn't go, carry us not up hence. And he's identifying with the people. He says, If we haven't got your presence, then we can't go. And the angel is saying, I can work with you. Moses is saying, come with us. He's pleading for the people. And then in verse 16, for it, he says, Wherein shall it be known that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? And Moses is still including himself with the people. And this is where Moses the mediator comes into his own. And he pleads with the angel. And in verse 17, And Yahweh said unto Moses, I will do this thing which you have spoken, only because you have found grace in my sight, for I know thee by name. And isn't that beautiful that the angel of Yahweh's presence actually gives in to Moses and he's he's pleading for Israel because he said, Moses, I'm only doing this because you and I are friends. We're on first name terms. And you can imagine they spoke to each other as Moses and Michael. They were the best of friends. And then Moses then asked him to show him his glory. He says, I want to see your physical glory. We know what happens following on from that in verse chapter 34 and verse 5. But having placed Moses in a particular spot, it says, And Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And he gave Moses to understand that God's not so much about physical glory. He'd already passed by Moses. He put him in the cleft of the rock and he says, You can't see the full glory. You you just wither away. He says, As I walk past with my full glory revealed, I will shield you and I'll just let you catch a glimpse of, of the back parts of me as I depart. But Moses, the real glory of Yahweh is not the power, the majesty, the blinding light. The real glory of Yahweh is his character. He's merciful and gracious. He proclaimed the name of Yahweh to him. And so there was that glorious acceptation of Moses' mediatorship and the restoration to Israel of the Yahweh angel as their guide in the wilderness. Isn't that glorious that even the other angel was not good enough for Moses? He needed the Yahweh angel to be among them. And that angel, as the prince of of Yahweh, sent out other angels to work on behalf of Israel. And you find in the book of Zechariah, chapter 1 and verse 8, that that angel is portrayed as the commander that dispatches other angels to walk to and fro through the earth and to bring it to a state of peace. In Exodus 17, verse 6, the Yahweh angel says, Go to Horeb and I will stand upon the rock. And we know that that rock was Christ. That angel was prefiguring the Lord Jesus Christ as God's personal representative on the earth. In Deuteronomy 33 and verse 8, just make a note and check it out for yourself sometimes. Dr. Thomas translates the verse, Thy Urim and Thummim shall be with the man, thy holy one, whom you tempted at Massa. And there was an angel that prefigured the Lord Jesus Christ in that rock at Massa. And so we find that Michael was the great prince of the children of Israel. But we notice when we come to Daniel chapter 12 that there is actually a great prince 
Michael was the prince of Israel, one of the chief princes, but when we come to Daniel 12, we're at the time of the end. We're at the Armageddon phase of God's plan. And there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. There's going to be a gathering of all nations to the time of trouble. There's going to be Armageddon and all the processes of that. And it says at that time shall Michael stand up and now he's called something different. He's called a great prince. I want you to notice what the Bible says about the greatness of the angels. It says this, that in relation to the angels, Christ hath by inheritance, by being the real total son of God, obtained a more excellent name than the angels. He actually is God's personal son. Hebrews 1 verse 13, unto which of the angels said God at any time, sit at my right hand. Not even to Michael he said that. The angels always stand in God's presence. Jesus was asked and invited to sit down in the presence of his Father. It says in the first of Peter 3 verse 22 that when Christ went to heaven, angels, authorities, powers were made subject unto him. And so we have in Daniel 12 verse 1 the being that leads the return to the earth is the great prince Michael. And Christ comes with the authority of the archangel, says Thessalonians, with the voice of the archangel commanding an authority that the dead should be raised and the living should be collected. And I submit to you that this Michael the great prince is the Lord Jesus Christ having taken over Michael's role as the personal representative of God on the earth. Now just notice that in the book of Daniel particularly and in the book of Ezekiel who was contemporary with Daniel but that Jesus Christ is known as the Prince of Yahweh's host. Look at these verses. Daniel 8 verse 11 He magnified himself even to the Prince of the host. Daniel 8 25 He shall stand up against the Prince of princes unto Messiah the Prince in Daniel 9 verse 25 the people of the Prince Daniel 9 verse 26 Ezekiel 44 speaking of the temple and parts of it is for the prince the prince he shall sit to eat bread before Yahweh my servant David or the beloved as David's name should always be translated in this sort of context a prince among them and so we find that we have Jesus Christ is the great prince and I submit to you that the title great is never applied to the angels it is only applied to the Lord Jesus Christ he is the great one that God intends to enthrone upon the earth and so the title of Michael he who is like unto God is given to Christ because of his obedience and his direct inheritance to the Father he shall be great Jerusalem the city of the great king greater love hath no man than Christ a great high priest Jesus the son of God Great is the Holy One in the midst of thee. He shall send a Saviour and a Great One. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the Great, that Great Shepherd of the sheep. And from Jesus Christ, the Prince of the Kings of the Earth, a leader and a commander of the people. All of those titles now are the right of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when it says in Daniel 12 that Michael the Great Prince shall stand up, you can only stand up if you've been sitting down. And that's why it can't be Michael the Archangel because he always stands in God's presence. When the time is appointed for the end of the age to come and the Lord Jesus Christ to return, Michael the great prince as he now is shall stand up and return to the earth. And wasn't that the vision that Stephen was showed before he was being stoned? What was it that God gave to encourage Stephen to know that he would be part of the great events of the time of the end. He says, I saw heaven opened and Christ standing at the right hand of God. In other words, for Stephen, the day of Christ's return had arrived. And God was telling him that death would be but a short sleep until that day. And he saw Christ standing at the right hand of God. Whereas in fact, at that very time, literally, Christ was sitting at the right hand of God. And so Michael the great prince shall stand up and come to rescue Israel once again. And it's a marvellous thing, brethren and sisters, that we can actually see these great things concerning Michael, the great prince. It says in Zechariah 14, Then shall Yahweh go forth, 
and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. And Christ now bearing the name of his Father, being Yahweh with us, will go out and his feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives. Yahweh's feet, because Christ now is Yahweh with us on the earth, as Michael was Yahweh with us in days gone by. Let's now move on to the other angel who is named for us, Gabriel. And we, we've titled him the communicating angel because that's really the, the most frequent work that he does in the Bible. But he has a number of roles. His name means the mighty God. But he also has another title which indicates one of his main tasks and that is that he shares with Michael the knowledge of the divine calendar. He's called in Daniel 8 verse 13 and if you've got a margin in the Oxford Bible you'll find it says there in Daniel 8 verse 13 the number of secrets or the wonderful number of Hebrew palmoni. Now when a margin gives you that much information you know that they were struggling. Well they were certainly struggling with this one. There are two Hebrew words that make up the Hebrew name palmoni or the title palmoni. There is the word mene which means wonderful. It's used the word used in Judges 18 verse 13 when the angel ascended in the fire and he said to Manoah and his wife my name is wonderful, Pele. Wonderful. Okay, just remember that one. So that's part of the name, Palmoni. The other word is the Hebrew word Mene. Remember what, the, after the writing on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tikal, you fasten. Numbered, numbered was what Mene stood for. So you have a combination word here, wonderful numberer. So here's an angel that has, along with Michael, shared responsibility for the divine calendar. He's got the times and the seasons at his fingertips. Which angel is it you find in Daniel 8 and chapter 9 that is giving Daniel time periods? 2300, 1335, etc. It's Gabriel. You see, he's the Palmoni. He's the wonderful number. Other angels are pleading with him, how long till this? And he says, well, that many years. How long till this? Well, that many years. He's the wonderful number that's got the control of the divine timetable. That's one of his major responsibilities. Well... The other job that he has is that he's very much involved with the work of Jesus Christ. You've got Michael the archangel who's involved with Israel and the kingdom of God and the big picture amongst the nations and you've got the other angel who's got the other part of the gospel, the name of Jesus Christ and the two of them share the divine calendar. You'd have to, wouldn't you? If you're going to work on one working on Christ and the times and the seasons in the fullness of time God sent his son into the world and Michael's got to know the time of the end and all the time periods that are there, these two have to share the divine calendar. And so you find in Daniel 10 verse 21 that Gabriel says, I will show you the scriptures of truth and none holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. And he's talking about the movements of nations, the king of Grecia, the king of Persia, the rise on the throne. Michael and I have got this all under control. And he goes and he just swings through from Daniel 10 through Daniel 11 and he says, these are all the events in Daniel 11. And in great detail he unfolds event after event after event, history unfolding in the future. Because he and Michael understand all that. Until in the end, by the time you get to the, to the end of Daniel 11, Daniel head, Daniel's head's reeling and, and Gabriel can say, well that's enough Daniel, you don't need to know any more than that. I could go on telling you about future history, but you can't really absorb any more. Don't worry about it Daniel, we'll seal up the books at the time of the end. But you see the two of them understood all these things. They knew what the plan of God was through all the ages. And so he's got two jobs, the, the work of Messiah and the divine timetable. So he's the, the, the Gabriel, the mighty God, and he's the Palmoni, the wonderful numberer. After Christ has been resurrected, this angel is called his angel, the personal messenger of Jesus Christ. And he then sends Gabriel back to mankind to go on communicating on his behalf. Revelation chapter 1, the revelation which God gave to Jesus Christ and he sent by the hand of his angel his angel, he's got a personal servant, angel, which we believe is Gabriel and we'll show you that later on which angel do you think came in the Garden of Eden, it says and there came to him an angel from heaven where else do angels come from brethren and sisters but from heaven, you see God dispatched the Gabriel angel to to reassure Jesus Christ that there was at, at God's right hand a glorious future for him and an angel came from heaven to reassure Christ. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify these things in the Ecclesias. 
And so you find that in the work of Christ, Gabriel is intimately involved. These are just a few of the instances we could mention in relation to Christ. The 70 week prophecy, the visit to Zacharias, the visit to Mary, the visit to Joseph, a number of those. The visit of the shepherds. He was led of the spirit into the wilderness. And the word spirit is used interchangeably with angels. For example, it says concerning Philip, that the angel spake to Philip. The angel, and it says, then the spirit caught away Philip. And you find that the word angel and spirit are quite interchangeable in some context. He was led off the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. So you see you have Gabriel very much involved with the Lord Jesus Christ. In relation to his communicating work, we find that many, many times it's Gabriel that does the explaining to men about what the prophecies actually mean. And it's very noticeable that Michael does not explain prophecies. What he does is he sends Gabriel to one to explain prophecies. You might remember in Daniel chapter 10 where it, you know, here's Daniel praying for three weeks to understand the visions and eventually Gabriel runs up almost out of breath and says, well I'm sorry I'm so late but I was tied up with the king of Persia and it was only when Michael came that I was able to get away and I'm now come to explain these things. I will show you the scriptures of truth. You find in Daniel chapter 8 that a voice comes when Daniel again is praying to understand. Gabriel, make that man to understand the vision. So you get the impression that of the two angels that Michael is the one that that is the supreme commander. He even directs Gabriel what to do. He says, I am come to show thee. Unto thee am I now sent. The angel that talked with me runs right through the prophecies of Zechariah and the first six chapters. And when Zechariah has heaven open and he's shown the vision to how the angels are at work, we have a commanding angel that directs other angels and we have the angel that talked with me, the angel that talked with me again and again. And in the notes we gave out, you'll actually find a colouring exercise to colour in the different angels in the first six chapters of Zechariah, which is a most useful exercise to make it legible. Gabriel was sent to Zechariah in the temple. I am Gabriel, sent to speak unto thee. You see, he's got this mission to communicate to people. Gabriel was sent from God to explain things to Mary. To the shepherds he said, Behold, I bring you good tidings. That was his role. And so you can go through Gabriel, that he's the angel that God sends to communicate. There stood by me this night, the angel of God whom I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. There came one of the seven angels and talked with me. Revelation 2, 21 verse 9. He that talked with me, I am come to make thee understand. The angel that talked with me in Zechariah again. I fell under worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. And Jesus says, I have sent mine angel to testify these things in the Ecclesiastes. And the angel that was concerned with Jesus Christ right through his life, his death and resurrection and his work with the Ecclesiastes was very likely Gabriel. And so we have two mighty angels who cooperate marvellously in fulfilling the work of God. One concerned with the kingdom, one concerned with the Lord Jesus Christ and his people. They are the only two angels that share the divine knowledge of God's timetable. You can imagine then that in the fullness of time, Gabriel having given the 70 weeks prophecy to outline the exact time that Christ would come into the world, how intensely they cooperated to move both nations and individuals in place for the birth of the Son of God. How they would have watched so closely over the events concerning his life so that he died at exactly the right moment in God's plan. After it was all finished, these two angels who both stand in the presence of God were found sitting on one of the rare occasions you find angels sitting when Peter and John looked into the tomb, what did they see? They saw two angels sitting. Because for the time being, their great work of 490 years had finished. Two angels sitting in the tomb. And between them, the grave clothes of the high priest. The work was accomplished. The great announcement on the Mount of Olives. How many angels were there to tell the disciples that he would come back? Two men stood by them in white apparel. Who do you think those two were? You see, there are two angels who share this great knowledge between them. And they are now joyfully submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ 
the true Son of God who came to heaven and was put over them. All power, said Jesus, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He's now over all the angels. Hebrews 1 verse 6, correctly translated in the RV, when he again bringeth in the firstborn into the world, when the firstborn of the dead came back to life, God's command was that all the angels of God worship him. He's gone into heaven, he's on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers, all the, the ranks of the angels now subject unto him. And so he now sends his angels out to do his will. And brethren and sisters, there is a most magnificent verse which shows us that all the power and the titles of the angels have been ascribed to the Lord Jesus Christ. What are the names and titles of the angels that we have? Well, we have the Prince of Yahweh's host, Gabriel, the mighty warrior, Michael, he was like unto God, Palmoni, the wonderful numberer, and Pele in Judges 13 verse 18, the wonderful. They are all the names and titles of the angels. Look at Isaiah 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government, the authority, the power, the responsibility will be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Pele. The Counselor. None of the angels were regarded as a counselor because that word indicates the mediatorship of Christ. The Mighty God, the Gabriel, the Everlasting Father, as it should be translated, the Father of the Age. He who is like unto God, representing God on earth now amongst us, and the Prince of Peace. And all of those titles that were once the province of the angels are now ascribed to Christ. All power is given unto him in heaven and in earth. And we could say much more about the relationship of the angels, but time fails us. I want to make, before we close, a very powerful exhortation from Michael the Archangel. All of these things are fascinating and, and really expand our minds to understand the purpose of God. But if we're not exhorted, as our brother Michael said, then exposition is of no use to us. We have to take away not only a greater understanding of God and his purpose, but an exhortation for this daily living. I want you to come with me to the first of Peter, chapter 2. Sorry, second of Peter, chapter 2. And let's just look at an exhortation based upon Michael the Archangel. And this is the only exhortation in the New Testament based upon the character of Michael and the qualities of the Yahweh angel. So it has to be significant, it has to be important to us. The context is what is described because we have a parallel record in the second of Peter chapter 2 and in Jude verse 9, the exact same incident is described. And what it is, it's going back to Zechariah 3 where Joshua the high priest was confronted with the adversaries, the Samaritans, who were trying to stop the work of rebuilding the temple. And Zechariah was shown in the night visions the real situation. They were, they were afraid the work would be stopped. And he was shown that this was a matter that was actually being decided by the angels. And as much as the adversary was at Joshua's right hand, in other words, stopping him from working on the temple... Every time he picked up a trowel, the, 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 the adversary would bump his right hand. He said, he also showed me Yahweh standing before Joshua. And so you see, the reassurance was there that they were not alone. That was what the vision was to teach them, that they were not alone. The Yahweh angel, who Jude tells us was actually Michael, was right there with Joshua the high priest to make sure that the work would be finished and to reward Joshua with a change of garments. And so you see that we have in this record, in Zechariah 3, a remarkable incident to prove them that the angels do watch over God's people in time of trial. But the lesson that's taken into Jude and into Peter is the attitude of the angel. Now let's look what it says. Now 2 Peter 2 is about the warning against apostasy from within. Those who will creep in through the back door to bring error into the ecclesia. And the warning is, how do you pick these people before they start preaching their abominable errors and they start going down the track of unrighteous behaviour. How do you pick the incipient errorist in your ecclesia? Well, one of the signs, says Peter and Jude, is their attitude and the way they speak about other brethren. Because if they're being driven by envy and self-importance, then they're going to be pulling down people in positions of responsibility. And so he says, this is how you recognise them. Verse 10, But chiefly those that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness 
They despise dominion. They hate those over the ecclesia. Presumptuous are they, self-willed, and they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So they pull down authority. They've got no respect for the proven teachers and leaders. They destroy reputations by innuendo, by slander, by suggesting that these people are driven by ambition. You hear phrases like, well, there really are no shepherds. You know, we're all shepherds. Who do these men think they are? Sour and bitter comments made against people who are respected in the ecclesia because they want the prominence. And in verse 11, and Jude and Peter make exactly the same point. How different, how different and how much more gracious in speech are the angels. Where he says, whereas angels... And he's talking about Michael, who are greater in power and might. And how much greater in power and might than ordinary men is Michael? He knew the Samaritans were wrong. He knew they were vicious. He knew they had to be resisted. He knew that God would wipe them out. And yet when Michael had to make judgment upon them, all he would say is this, Yahweh of hosts, God in heaven, rebuked the oath Satan. That was as far as he was prepared to go. He would not say unkind things about the Samaritans. He would not accuse them of their evil motives. He said judgment is a matter for God. And that's the exhortation that comes through to the New Testament. And brethren and sisters, if that's all the angel is prepared to say, who knows men's motives, who knows God's purpose, but he defers judgment to God, how much more careful ought we to be in our judgments about each other? Jude says he does not bring railing accusations. Understanding that God is the final judge, he would not use abusive terms as Weymouth translates it. He left judgment to God. Yahweh rebuked thee, O Satan. How much more careful or imperfect men to be? How much more moderate in speech ought we to be? If angels great in power, great in might, great in knowledge, speak so carefully that our speech always be seasoned with salt, full of grace. Let us learn, brethren and sisters, from the archangels. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. Please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever service you are listening from to help people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this talk, share it on social media so other people can find it too. For show notes and links to the talk that you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash gct. We want to encourage everyone to share their thoughts from the talk this week on Facebook or Instagram, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks or on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media platforms. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.